Oh, hello and, uh, and good evening and welcome to uh, this uh, IOP London and South East branch meeting of uh, an online meeting uh, with an IOP lecture this evening. It's uh, on behalf of the group from uh, the University of Hertfordshire. Uh, we would normally be doing these face-to-face. -face. Um, this is the first one we've had since our last face-to-face -face one back in February uh, 2020. Um, my name is Alan Davies. I'm Professor of Mathematics at the University of Hertfordshire and it's usually my job to, uh, to, uh, to host the, uh, the, the sessions that we have there um, and to, to welcome you. Now that I know that in the audience there's going to be plenty of you who have seen us before at the University of Hertfordshire um, but I'd also like to welcome those of you who are not familiar with us. Um, normally at this particular juncture, I will be uh, giving you some information uh, about uh, the possibility of a fire alarm and where the uh, uh, escape doors are. Uh, but of course, I don't need that tonight because you probably know that in your, in your own your own house. Uh, so that's uh, that's where we are, and I, I guess we can just really move straight into um, uh, this evening's talk. Um, our speaker tonight is uh, Dr. Sophie Carr, um, who um, was it was voted to be the world's most interesting mathematician. I'm sure she'll say something about that when uh, her time comes along. Um, she has a background uh, of studying uh, fluid mechanics and uh, worked in the aerospace industry, uh, but did a PhD in uh, Bayesian statistics and has since then been working uh, as a statistician. So without further ado, perhaps I can pass you over and Sophie, over to you. Thank you very much. So I'm going to make sure, first of all, that we can all see the right screen. So, is that right? Can, everybody, can you now see a, a screen, Alan? Is that working OK? I can see the screen, but I'm not sure if I can see all of it. But then it's probably because I've got the picture of us at the top. OK, so hopefully. Hopefully all being well, there's a screen with some, some subtitles um, on there that everybody can yeah. see. Yeah, and if yeah. not, then I'm sure somebody can let me know and we'll, we'll, we'll um, have a bit of a jig about and make sure that everybody can see what they need to do. So um, thank you ever so much for, for having me. And I'm really sorry that this isn't in person. Hopefully maybe uh, one day it, it, it will be. And I was asked to come and, and, and give a talk about trust fakes and overload. And, really it's talking about a, a subject that's ever so close to my heart which is statistics and just like Alan said actually I trained as a, an engineer I grew up wanting to play with airplanes more than anything else and I was the person who would be building space rockets out of her lego set when actually it was meant to be a house and I never quite had enough heat shields from the roof tiles and I just always had a complete fascination with, with airplanes. And that really actually came from physics as well. And at school, physics was by far and away my favorite subject. And maths was just something I had to do in order to be good at physics. Um, it was Bernoulli's equation. I remember really clearly sitting in my A-level maths um, class and being taught about Bernoulli's equation, just thinking that this was absolutely um, amazing. And that was the first time I really realised that maths and physics and aeroplanes could all sort of inter, um, sort of come together. Uh, I went on to study aeronautical engineering. I became an aeronautical engineer and had the time of my life flying uh, with aeroplanes. But it was whilst I was flying, I became interested in information overload. And, and really, I became interested in why people stop being able to take in information. When is it that they hit that point that they just they just can't take any information and they start to miss really key pieces of information things that they really need to focus on and that's what I did my PhD in. Uh, my PhD is in Bayesian Belief Networks and it was done part-time whilst I was working and then uh, 12 years ago I was made redundant and I set up my my own little company and since then I've really been working in statistics some people call it data science and the only other uh, important things you need to know about me are that I, I like coffee over tea uh, my favourite food is the pear and my favourite flower is the tulip and that's kind of me um, but what I want to talk to you tonight is about how people perceive maths, uh, maybe about how they perceive numbers more generally particularly in uh, how we look at the media and talk a little bit about uh, 
trust in numbers and sometimes how we get overloaded by numbers themselves and how can we start to to work with that and i think the best way to start that is actually understanding why stats and maths is, is so important to everyday life but also understanding about why some people see uh, maths as being questionable because i know and i know as scientists and physicists you see maths and science within our lives absolutely everywhere we go and maths in action to me there's two brilliant examples here um two coffees made the same way uh, can have very different tastes and this was work done by the university of portsmouth um, that was actually looking at how to make the perfect espresso and i really like that coffee that's what i have i have one coffee a day i have it before i clock any more than two one cup of coffee i can't sleep at night never have a second and what the the research showed was that um, how to make a coffee taste the same actually comes down to the size of the, the grind. So the greater the proportion of coffee that there is um, that gets dissolved into the water. So the modelling showed that you need needed really fine ground coffee. But when that was actually put into practice, what was happening was that, that the coffee machine was getting clogged up and actually they needed a larger coffee particle to actually get consistent tastes um, of, of coffee. Now, if you're not a coffee drinker and you prefer tea, and that's fine because my husband is certainly a, uh, a tea drinker more than coffee, what he found this year, uh, no, last year now, was actually published, is that it was looking at the stochastic um, effects and the random effects of stirring a cup of tea. Now, if you say the phrase stochastic analysis to lots of people, um, they might switch off. They might not love the maths. They might not know why they should care about the maths and they might see this and actually think it's quite superficial oh you know mathematicians are pretending that they can model how to make an espresso or they've come up with some bizarre equation to model the stirring in a, a cup of tea but this is really fundamental maths i remember being at university and watching um vortices in cups of coffee as i dragged my spoon across and thinking it was absolutely amazing it's really important maths that people might look at and think is actually quite frivolous and maybe they don't understand the, the importance of what they're seeing but one thing that news does really really love is um, a hero and one thing i care about quite a lot is that statistics to me is a superpower it's something that lets us do amazing things but it's also a superpower that is presented both as a villain and as a hero so we see that all the time when we're looking in the media whether that be in your social media or whether that be in the news that you read um, there are these numbers and numbers are portrayed in such different ways but if we just step back for a moment and have a think about superpowers there are lots and lots of them and, and it might be that you want to fly or run really fast and i always wanted to fly but i'm much more of a captain marvel with my hands as opposed to a necessarily a case sophie um, sophie i think yeah. you're i think you're stuck on your first slide oh is my my slide not moving oh yeah. let's see because i've gone through a couple of slides right okay uh let's try turning that off again and uh, let's try turning that back on oh dear let's try again i'm so sorry um what can you see now, Alan? I can see it looks like a uh, a box of um, box of comics um, and superheroes. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So if yeah, I yeah. quickly try, if I do this, does it change screen? No. No. Oh, this worked in practice, didn't it? Did yes. <laughs> Let's try again. Okay, I can see a. Okay, so if I right, can you see bunches of words? I can see loads of words, uh, superheroes. Yeah, they are superheroes. Right, so let's yeah. see. Let's see if we can trick quickly, see if we can make this work back and forth. So can you see, has that moved backwards now? No. Oh, I don't know why this isn't updating. <clears throat> oh, dear. Oh, this is annoying, isn't it? I've tried all the options that we did in practice that made this work. Oh, you've gone back now. Right. I've gone back now. Okay. Uh, so if I we stay there, can you see the screen still? Yeah. Yeah. You can. Okay. 
And is it moving? I can now see the, uh, uh, the all the names of the. Right, so we are moving. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Right. So I think I think we've got it working. So we'll try we'll try running um, this. I'm really sorry about that. So I was talking about how awesome superpowers um, are, and also about how I think that statistics is a superpower, but it's one that can be a villain and it's one that can be uh, a hero. And when I go thinking about what superpowers and what superheroes we, we actually have, I, I put some together and I'm going to apologise now um, if your favourite isn't on there. These are what came up over our family uh, dinner table one time. And I'm well aware that there are some in here who aren't a single uh, superhero because Guardians of the Galaxy is a group um, and the Fantastic Four are a group. But what I want to do is, is actually get you to think about the different ways in which people get superpowers and the different ways in which we can use them and how we can start to look at these in terms of mathematics and actually how that starts to be a story that we can we can work with. So one way that we might actually want to put these together is actually look at the different way that they, the superheroes are made. So hopefully, has that changed slide, Alan? Just to check. Yes, yeah. Brilliant. OK, we're up and running again. So we might do a Venn diagram. Now, you might not necessarily agree with how I've put these together, but what I've done is roughly grouped these superheroes um, on how they became superheroes. Um, and it's OK if you don't agree with it, because math, um, for example, is, it's full of lots of different debates. And um, in the middle there, I've popped Black Panther because I think that Black Panther got his superpowers because of an event and because there were aspects that didn't quite come from Earth. But he also has some really cool uh, technology. Now, one of the things I realised when I was creating these slides and thinking about how statistics is a superpower that's portrayed both ways in the media is that there are actually two superheroes on here that aren't um, included. And if you're wondering who those are uh, and who I've missed out, it's actually one of my complete favourite superheroes, and that is um, the Black Widow, because I am a huge fan, an absolutely huge fan of the Avenger films. And what I realised is that when I was putting those powers together, and when you start thinking about superheroes and you start thinking about what type of power you might want to have, um, Hawkeye's a master marksman, he's got amazing skills, but he's developed those through hard work and practice. So he does have a great bow, but it's actually not the technology that gives him his ability. And also when you think about um, the Black Widow, she too has learnt her skills by practice and by putting in hard work. Now I don't have her types of skills um, by, any, by any stretch of the imagination. But when we see superpowers, when we want a superpower it tends to be something that we can't do and it tends to be viewed as something that we can't achieve or get naturally but actually there are superheroes who are presented all the time who have been a villain like the black widow who became a superhero she's been on both sides and she actually learned her own skill so this got me thinking about how we can look at trust and fakes within numbers themselves and how can we show that maths and statistics, whilst it's sometimes viewed as a villain, is it, actually a hero and something that we can trust as well. So within that context, there's actually some areas of mathematics that make it into stories, that make it into um, superhero worlds, they are actually quite truthful. So if you think of Harry Potter, one of the subjects they actually study is aromancy, which is um, how to predict the future with numbers. Now, we would call that a predictive algorithm, and I will absolutely agree with you that modelling and algorithms have a pretty mixed reputation in the media. Um, they are often uh, vilified for being wrong or not being accurate enough or not providing information that's that's useful but those of us who work with numbers know that there is very rarely any certainty as we look ahead there's very rarely definite certainty where we are now so 
we have our arithmancy, but there's also um, premonition. And so examples of this for the destiny in the Avengers, because uh, she's a villain, but she can, she can, uh, sorry, in the X-Men, she can actually look ahead, but also um, from the Twilight series, which is another film set that we watched quite a lot, Alice Cullen in Twilight has the gift of premonition. Now, seeing in the future really to me is about pattern spotting. It's about the ability to look ahead all back and see those patterns and start to understand um, what questions you might want to ask to be able to change that pattern or to understand that pattern or to stop the pattern if it's something that we're not particularly interested in happening um, again. And that's something that, again, we have the maths for now, but has made it into, into stories that people think is quite unusual or maybe a superpower. And the last one, well, it's solving puzzles. It's the it's the old story of, of almost good versus evil. And we've got the Riddler and, and Batman, but it's how do we ask the questions to defeat the Riddler? How do we solve the puzzles? Because the one thing that unites all mathematicians, uh, whether we are applied mathematicians or we are statisticians, pure mathematicians, where, wherever we think we sit, actually, what we are are people who really, really love working with puzzles and solving puzzles. And I think one of the issues we have is actually explain to people about how great puzzles are and how wonderful it is to work with numbers. Because the one thing uh, that numbers do that lots of people forget is that it moves us. When we start to see those numbers, whether they are in books or whether they are in um, the newspapers or our social media. People have a real visceral reaction to numbers. And that can be anything from 60% of startups failing or 27% of FTSE board uh, members being women. It's those types of reactions that actually spur communities on to change. Now, maths moves us in all sorts of other ways. Uh, there is an absolute beauty and elegance in a, a proof. Um, there's a beautiful simplicity when things come together and two curves just join up. Numbers and maths move us all the time and they move us in exactly the way that great art moves. So I really like um, uh, paintings by Caravaggio and I really like Turner as well. Degas' Little Dancer is um, the statue that I'd have in my house if I had a complete choice. But when we start to think about trusts and fakes and overload of information, it's always important to remind ourselves that we're actually talking often about an emotive reaction. So when we start to think about how can we actually really build, hopefully that's moved. No, uh, yes. Yeah, can we see a, uh, uh, sorry, this is moving a little bit. see a nice typewriter. Typewriter, oh, lovely typewriter, okay. So one of the things about um, building up the trust in numbers is that it involves those of us who are involved in science and those of us who are involved in producing numbers to really actually do the hard work. And I suppose that's why at times maths can have um, a bit of a reputation because it can be a bit tedious and it can be a bit repetitive. But that's part of the beauty to me. When we really work in maths and science, there is that aspect that automation can help churn numbers out. Um, and it's never really been easier to just press some buttons and numbers pop out. But actually, what it requires us to do is to look both ways. It's to look to see if a hypothesis can be proved or if it's been disproved. To actually slow down, and to do that thorough work and to really get into the depth of what we're doing. And it comes down to the question of, do we want to get the numbers right or do we want to get the right number? Because there is such a difference in how we go about calculating those and such a difference in how we go about communicating our results as a community of scientists. If we really want our numbers, to stand the test of time, then as mathematicians and scientists, 
we need to make sure that they are reliable, potentially repeatable. We need to understand and be able to communicate why they were collected, um, how they were collected. We've got to put the effort in to understand any bias and limitations that are in our data set. We've got to make sure that we can define and describe the populations, the sample size that we've worked with. We really need to understand who we're engaging with when we actually set about communicating our results. Can the people that we're trying to communicate this with see themselves? There's often such a focus on making sure that we can just get a number that we don't always have the ability to step back and ask ourselves, are we getting the numbers right? Or are we just getting the right number, the number that will get people off our back, that will give an answer to, to who we report to? And I think letting people have the time to do the deep work is something that's really hard to achieve, but is absolutely crucial to the work we do. It underpins trust in numbers. If we trust our numbers, then our ability to explain why they should be trusted actually becomes a lot easier. So when we start to talk about uh, coming up with trust in numbers, I would say the first superpower really is to slow down. To slow down and to find the time to look at the little things. So that fundamental question of are we getting the numbers right? Can we talk about the method that was used? Um, and it might be complicated, but we can express it in a way that people can understand. And also it's about teaching people. So sometimes by understanding what's not been included in the data set and the method that was used is just as important about talking about what has been included. So excluded and included, but the method, slow down. Let's, let's take a bit of time to really look at the little things. So the second thing I think we need to look at is um, what's the uncertainty? So really, is a number absolute? Are we talking about an absolute number? Because if we're honest about uncertainty, we can't really shy away from it because it is absolutely everywhere. Let's be upfront about it. Um, it's easy for the uncertainty to get lost in the story. It can be easy to just gloss over it because people want certainty. And I think uncertainty is awesome and is something that we need to get really comfortable with. Um, talking about uncertainty doesn't make us look weak. Talking about uncertainty makes us be honest and truthful and to talk about the limitations and where our work can be applicable and about how we can take things forward. There's lots and lots of different ways of showing uncertainty. And I think if we keep working as science communicators together, then we'll be able to help people understand what numbers um, and results can be trusted and what they should necessarily be looking for in a number that they trust. The final thing I think when we talk about trust is actually the language that we use. So how have we communicated and expressed what we've done. So can somebody look at this work and understand fundamentally why the research was done or why that poll was done or why the data was collected? Can they see themselves in it? But crucially, can they see the so what? What does this impact me? Why, why should I worry about this? Why should I care about this number? Why should I invest the time in, in reading um, about this? And if you want to see some great statistics, uh, in journalism, then the Royal Statistical Society has um, an annual journalism award for statistics. And I wholeheartedly recommend looking at those because there were some absolutely fantastic examples about how numbers and statistics can be communicated on really complex topics, but in a way that is accurate um, and accessible. So I've talked a bit about trust um, and how we can help build that, but there is a, a slight um, issue and I think this is a, a brilliant example of it you know I only believe the statistic that I adopted myself um, 
people have a bit of an issue, uh, mainly I think because of the phrase that is lies, sand lies and statistics. Now I would rephrase that because I genuinely think that it's actually lies, sand lies and misunderstanding. Uh, I don't know many people and I am aware that there is fake information, you know, readily available for people to find. But um, I think actually people don't set out to deceive, or at least not the people I work with. Most people who work in science and research work really, really hard to explain what's going on. Unfortunately, some people misunderstand, and that's often when numbers start to get uh, misrepresented and misused or put out of context such that it serves somebody else's purpose and not necessarily the purpose for which the statistics were actually um, developed. So if we're going to talk about how do we Okay. Um, how do we actually spot some fake statistics? Then you know, there's some key things I think we can all talk about and start to share with people. And one of the the brilliant big ones is is actually is there a really clear link between the headline, that clickbait that has made you want to look at that story, and the text that's actually written? Because there are three stories that have to be managed with any numbers. Um, there's the story that is in the data itself, which we try and find. Um, there's the story in the results, which is what we've found, which we hope is the story in the, in the numbers, but sometimes not. And then there's the story that gets picked up. It might be the summary uh, if you've got an internal report. Sometimes it's the results that get picked up by the media. And how we handle that uh, is quite hard. What we need to make sure when we're looking at fake information or fake statistics is that is there a connection, a clear connection between the headline that we're looking at and the written content? Can you see why the headline is written? Is there anything substantive, anything that's in the written text that makes you believe the headline that you're looking at? Um, there's also the wonderful wonderful world of visualizations um, and not least of which is scaling a graph um, and i've got some examples in, of my favorite graphs um, i love these they are quite old now but they are two of my favorite ever pie charts um, the 2012 presidential run last time i checked um 70 had 60 had 63 was slightly more than 100 percent um 63 is definitely less than 70, but it does seem to be the slightly larger portion on the pie chart on the right. But that might be because it's a 3D pie chart for which I have a particular dislike. I'm not a fan of pie charts at all, actually. Um, and the one on the left, well, this is wonderful. Uh, this is more of an infographic come pie chart. And there's, there's, there's just so much wrong with it, to be honest with you. Um, I'll let you have a look. You can start to look at the numbers and try to to work out what you can see. It's more about trying to understand what's on the pie chart than there is that you actually learn from the pie chart. If we're going to spend all this time in finding information, and by the way, I'm not saying that these are examples of fake numbers or fake statistics. These are just examples of how to not necessarily share uh, information in the best way. We need to be really careful about how we actually choose to present the numbers because the misrepresentation or the accidental misrepresentation is something that will be picked up on and people can then start to put it within their own context. Um, understanding if an issue is framed in a certain way is another way in which information can be taken out of context um, and it can be as simple as starting with the way that a question is framed within a survey. Um, some brilliant examples of this in statistics um, that have been in the news. One of the really famous ones is that uh, an extra glass of wine will shorten your life by uh, an average of 30 minutes. It's as bad as smoking. Well, when you really, really go digging into that uh, report, what you'll find is um, if you have three glasses a night, which by the way is one over the recommended limit, if you have that every single day of your life, then your expectancy is lowered, not just one glass. 
Uh, another one from January 2018, the BBC reported um, that official UK figures showed UK unemployment had fallen by 1.4 million, and that was genuinely brilliant news. The thing is, is that the error bounds were plus and minus 77,000. So there was somewhere between a 74,000 rise and 8,004. Um, and that's a very different headline. So we need to be careful. And then, of course, there is the wonderful, wonderful world of the spurious um, correlation. So I am a female in STEM um, and I do have a PhD. Uh, the question is, uh, do I have one because people go and watch sport in America? And I would really love to see this chart uh, updated for the last sort of 18 months to two years. I, I actually went on the website today to see if that information was available. and It's not quite up there yet. Now, it's easy to, to take a simple view. Um, about the charts I've just shown. But the point is that we have these numbers that are clickbait because people have quite short attention spans and the news, the media, the social media want you to start looking at the numbers. And like I said at the start, these numbers give you emotional reactions. So when numbers are presented in a way that is inadvertently misleading or even worse, actually had um, spuriously created sources. It's really hard to separate them out. Like I said, I don't know people who intentionally set out to deceive, but there are people out there who do that. So the question then comes, how do we help people when there is an absolute overload of information, a complete and total overload? People have to balance a perception that statistics and numbers are manipulated to deceive with the knowledge that you can't just discount every single number that you see. Numbers inform conversations, really important conversations and how people understand the world, whether that be what's happening to society, whether that be global warming, um, changes to the economy or the spread of a virus. So if you can't assume that all numbers are false and that statistics and maths are there to help these conversations, how can we help people who are so swamped by information understand when people have done their very, very best to get the numbers right? I, for one, and I'm sure you're the same, seem to never stop reading. And I do love reading. I'm, I, I do love reading, uh, whether that be to switch off or for what I have to do for work. But on an average day, there are times when simply keeping up on top of my emails, let alone keeping up on the development of my favourite areas of maths um, or the business that I, I work in, it's almost impossible to keep up with the information that almost didn't exist before. So it seems to interfere, it doesn't interfere with our, our natural thought processes. There is a point when I suddenly realise that I'm not really taking the information in. I am at best just skim reading and I'm not talking about when I was doing my PhD that I would read the abstract and conclusion and then decide if I want to read the middle bit. But I mean, it's almost like the phonetic pace means that I am just trying to take in keywords, just trying to take in the sense of what I'm being sent. And that's the point when I know I have to walk away and stop and think and have a cup of tea and come back. Because it's exactly the same when people are scrolling and trying to find information online. You're skimming on your phone, you're skimming through the social media, you're scrolling through the results of a search engine. How do we help people when Things are designed to catch their eye. Out of all that information that's coming at them, so what, what makes them stop and click? Now, I don't think there is a simple way to stop this or to help people, but I do think that there are three things we can do to step up and really start the conversations about how we can help trust in numbers. And the first one really, really is helping people get comfortable with being uncomfortable. We need to somehow start conversations and get everybody used to the fact that 
point answers are not the solution to everything. Where people are happy to talk about error bounds and ranges and confidence intervals and uncertainty. And I think if we can get people used to those wider range of numbers, that the answer might not be 10, it's somewhere between 8 and 12, or whatever the answer is, that people get used to those types of conversations, I think that will help us all because it will stop people realizing that it's okay, or it's, it will stop people expecting a definite answer. And that takes away some of the pressure of having to always give a point estimate. Secondly, and comes down to one of my, my favorite areas of maths, I think we need to share the love and the joy, genuinely share the love and the joy of conditional probabilities. How you read them, how you understand them, and what do they mean? Because there is a real difference between the probability that you have a disease given you've got a po positive test result and the probability of a positive test result given that you've got a disease. Now for a lot of people, to their minds that is the same question and it's not. So how can we start having conversations to talk about the different calculations of conditional probabilities, about what they really mean, about how they can interpret the sentences that they're seeing, what questions should they be asking when they see the different sentences, and thirdly, I think we should be shouting from the rooftops about how absolutely fantastic it is to have a scientific and inquiring mindset. Uh, how do we start shouting that people should be questioning the numbers that they see, raising points when they think it might not be necessarily a number that they want to trust? How do we get them to ask about why they aren't being told certain information that would help them make an informed decision. Um, how do we get them to talk about what they're searching for and why? How many times have you been down a rabbit hole and find yourself just doing, just slightly changing your Google searches just because you've seen one answer and maybe you want to rephrase it? How do we get people to talk about what data sources they trust and for how long that they trust them for? How do we talk about people taking breaks from trusted sources of information going away? And maybe just doing something such as reading a different journal, picking up a different book. How do we get people to question the pace at which they're searching for the numbers and why they need the numbers necessarily so quickly? How do we get people to question the pace at which we're working at when we're trying to understand if we want to trust the number? or not. I think that really, that last point is really about how do we get people to understand it's great to do your own deep work, to take some time and to ask some questions. One of the things I love about working in um, maths and science, particularly maths, because I've worked in maths for longer than I've worked in engineering now, is that it is a place where you get to listen to lots of different viewpoints. It can be all too easy in life um, to just dismiss the views you um, don't agree with or to dismiss the views that don't lie with yours. Uh, it can be really, really hard to challenge the status quo and it can be even harder to challenge the status quo and to communicate your results clearly. I think it's great within maths and science when you get to look and see that the pressures other people are operating under and to see things from a different perspective. Some of my favourite, favourite times in maths have been when there have been some really raging debate. So I'm a Bayesian statistician and some of my best friends are frequentists and we have some wonderful banter. Um, I've seen situations where we have literally and metaphorically been on the different sides of the table. Uh, and I know that that must happen in physics, but we all, but you know, Bayesian frequentists, we still love statistics. But to make a real impact as a community of mathematicians and scientists and to really help people understand what numbers to trust, 
maybe how to spot a fake, uh, and how to help them understand the overload that they're possibly getting. I think it's a good place to start that as a community, maybe we, um, we listen to each other a bit more. And once we've listened to each other a bit more, then we start listening to our the consumers of numbers. And we start to understand uh, more of what they need to understand our work. And that way we can start to really have some active engagement. But it really does start with um, active listening. And if we can do that, then I think we've got a really good chance of making a difference to improve society and to help improve the world that uh, we live in. So in summary, for me, um, trust fake and overload with numbers actually really needs everybody to just slow down slightly, to give themselves time to do that deep work, definitely, definitely to talk more, uh, but really crucially to actively listen so i really hope you go and listen to other people thank you sophie thank you very much indeed